Amen. The year 1983 marked the 500th anniversary of the great reformer Martin Luther, whose stature increases with time. Found by his deathbed, scrawled in German and Latin, was this declaration, we are beggars, that is true. That statement may have inspired Dr. D. T. Niles to say, evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where he can find a piece of bread. Not a sweet roll and a cup of coffee, but a bite of the staff of life, bread. The church is a fellowship of beggars, receiving and offering love, support, and hope. Committed Christians acknowledge their dependence upon God and their interdependence on one another. They are always in the bread line, if not receiving, then giving. Bow your heads with me for a moment. Almighty God, you have called your church to witness that in Christ, you have reconciled us to yourself. Grant that by your Holy Spirit, we may, be, we may proclaim the good news of your salvation so that all who hear it may receive the gift of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I want to share a word with you from the Lord. Not the how, but the who. Turn to someone next to you and tell them that. Not the how, but the who. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. From our gospel text, John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, theologians debate whether today's text is about the Lord's Supper. On the one hand, some argue that none of those who heard Jesus speak that day would have made any connection to an event that was yet in the future. Jesus' Passover meal with his disciples on the night before his death. On the other hand, others argue that it's impossible to hear the word bread in connection with Jesus and not think of Holy Communion. In a way, both sides make valid arguments. After all, unless God gives you the revelation knowledge about something that has not happened yet, how can you know it? Just using your natural senses and human reason. Faith itself is naturally dependent upon God giving to us what we have no way to produce or obtain by our own efforts. Faith is a gift. Amen, somebody. Now, one of our problems is that we get so caught up in plans and projects, thinking that we can control events and outcomes by our ability to plan. If we can systematize something, we can claim to understand it. And we think that if we can understand it, we can control it. How many of you all parents have been struggling with that from time to time? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and to an extent, that does work in worldly things because God has enabled us as his image bearers to declare and act upon circumstances to make things happen. But because we've lost the spiritual elements of that image, we have seen that ability used for evil and for good, at least in terms of the first use of God's law, civic righteous, righteousness. Isaiah declares in Isaiah 32, verse 7 and 8, as for the scoundrel, his devices are evil. He plans wicked schemes to ruin the poor with lying words, even when the plea of the needy is right. But he who is noble plans noble things, and on noble things he stands. The Apostle Paul described our situation before we are born again of the Spirit of God in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, in this way. They are darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them 
due to the hardness of their heart. We try to look at history and from that information determine a surefire path to the future. When we are right, it confirms to us that we can do what we will. And when we are wrong, we find somebody to blame. <laughs> this all happens because in our fallen condition, we forget our limitations. We don't know what we don't know. God's will concerning us. Proverbs 16, 9 says to us, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Uh-huh. God knows how everything comes together, for he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, from the life of the sparrow to the lifespan of empires. Because we're made in God's image according to his likeness and given the vocation of being his stewards, he gives us what we need in order to fulfill these various tasks. He gives us his word. Now that giving is rooted in our relationship with him, a relationship that has its foundations not in your ability, but in his will, a divine will that apart from the grace and mercy of God, we resist in our fallen condition. Oh, you don't have to say amen there. <laughs> Jesus continues, verse 35, he said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. We look at the people in Judea and Galilee when Christ walked with his disciples, seeing all that he was saying and doing before them and shake our heads. We pity them, watching as Jesus fulfilled everything that he said, did signs and wonders that they knew were unusual, and in some cases recognized as signs that he was unique. We say, of course, we would have known we would have followed him. We would have believed. We would have rejoiced to see and hear what they saw and heard. We sometimes lose sight of the truth as it is in Christ Jesus of just how blessed we are to be called the children of God. Jesus continues. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Now, if you know that Christ is for you, say amen. If you know that he died for your sins, Say amen again. And if you know that you are united with him in holy baptism, give the Lord a hand praise. Praise him for all, for whom all blessings flow. See, just like Peter in his confession, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but the Father in heaven. And through the preaching of the gospel, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians church in Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Oh, God is not selfish and stingy. He poured it out. Oh, today when you take communion, you're going to get a sip. But when God pours out his grace, he pours it out exceedingly. Uh, but you can drown in that grace. <laughs> Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Yes, God has a plan. He has, as an old witnessing track used to say, a wonderful plan for your life. Now, after feeding the people the previous day, both naturally and spiritually, Jesus said to them, verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. 
Some people take those words from that witnessing track and they say it to people and they say it to people who are struggling. They say it to people who are suffering and they put before them the idea that God has a wonderful plan for your life while you're sitting there struggling, trying to figure out where your next meal is going to come from. But if you just come to church with me, if you just join my ministry, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And if you show how much you trust in him by putting a little trust in me. And then the person said, well, how do I do that, preacher man? After all, I didn't grow up in church. Well, you show that you trust in him by trusting in me, by supporting my ministry. I remember one time a long time ago looking at a guy on TV and he had a book and the book said basically that if you follow this plan that you wouldn't be struggling anymore. You wouldn't have to worry about money and bills and finances. And so I called, I called him up. He was on TV. I know it costs money to be on TV. So I called him up. I said, I want to talk to the preacher that was on TV. And the person on the phone said, well, you can't talk to him, but I can help you. I said, okay, well, here's what I need. I need that book. He said, oh, praise the Lord. I said, so here's my address. And I was starting to give him my address. He said, okay, well, you want to do it on MasterCard or Visa? I said, MasterCard or Visa? No, no, I want the book. He said, yes, yes, we're going to send you the book. Do you want MasterCard? I said, no, 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 you don't understand. You said, or your, your preacher said, that if I had this book, I would never need to worry about bills anymore. And right now, I'm worried about paying rent next week. I need the book. If you send me the book, I'll send you the money. Well, needless to say, I didn't get that book. But praise God for whom all blessings flow. God had a job waiting for me. And the job enabled me to pay the rent. And the job enabled me to take care of myself and my family. That book didn't do nothing for me because it stayed right where it was. But this was all rooted in something that was good, right, and salutary. It was honorable. I wanted to do what was right. We struggle in our flesh to do what is right. Most of us want to do the right things. We try to do the right things, amen? And it should give us joy to know that God will not, desire the de will not deny the desire of our hearts for eternal life. It should give us joy to know he will not withhold from us the victory that is not rooted in our good deeds, but is rooted in his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It should give us joy to know that God has good news for the weary, that he's got good news for those who are troubled, that he's got good news to give strength to those who struggle in their flesh to do what is right. All we need to do is look on the sun and believe in him. To know that death is not the last word. Hell does not have the final say. It's not the how, saints. It's the who. See, we congratulate ourselves for being so much wiser than those folks in Galilee were. And yet too many Christians live as functional atheists. Titus 1.16 says, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. The world has heard the witness of the church for over 2,000 years, and yet, even today, the clear teachings of Scripture are challenged, rejected, and ignored because they are deemed to be too harsh, judgmental, and obsolete in our postmodern era. The children of this age are just like that generation in that respect. Verse 41, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? See, they wanted to restrict Jesus' identity to what they thought that they knew, his familial identity. They knew his mama. 
and they thought they knew his daddy. They thought he was just like them. Mm. And today the world looks at the church as do some who claim to be part of the church and only see people who, just like them, are sinners. And therefore, since they are no different, how does the church make the claim that it possesses the mind of Christ? How does the church claim to know the will of God in an era when it appears that anything that can be known is revealed by scientific research, the results of which are certain? Now, of course, that's the exact opposite of what scientists themselves say about knowledge, particularly the hard sciences. The data leads them to conclude things like the age of the earth or the risk of global climate change or the proper understanding of human identity in its various ethnic and sexual relationships. But what they seem to be concluding, at least based on what I read on Facebook, you know, Facebook is always right. The more information that we uncover, the more confused we become. The Bible doesn't say much of anything about gender. What it does say appears to be rather straightforward and narrow by our standards. But our research has us now thinking that there's no such thing as knowing who you are. Only the hope that drugs and other medical procedures can give you peace when your mind is clearly conflicted. That money can buy you security and that there are experts who know how to run everything and take care of everybody if only those foolish Christians would just get with the program. But Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God and everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Hmm. You know, the spirit of the age has even infected and affected the church. We look for plans and programs to do what only the Holy Spirit of God, working through the ministry of word and sacrament, can do. The world, and even some within the church, have turned away from the church, the bride of Christ, and turned to the philosophies and myths of pagan, animistic, idolatrous, and atheistic worldviews that deny the truth as it is in Christ. The gospel remains the only answer that God has given, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, that all God's people say, amen. The message that Christ died for you, and you and you, and you too back there, it's the only message that will take away your sins. The preaching of law and gospel alone exposes the sin that is systematically plagued the world, damaged all that God has given us as a gift, and caused us to bite and devour one another. But God offers us better food. Somebody say, better food. Food that will nourish our souls and prepare us for eternity. I know some of y'all are looking pretty hungry. It's, you know, it's... It's almost five o'clock. You're thinking about dinner time. Uh-huh. But I'm not talking about what we're going to have after this service. Oh, that'll fill you up for now. But you'll want some more in the morning. Oh, no, I'm talking about that food that will take you from today to eternity. From this moment to the moment right after you take what's supposed to be your last breath. The moment that puts you in the in the presence of your Lord and Savior. That food is his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says, verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna, the what is that, in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, and if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Better than a plan, better than a program, Jesus Christ our Lord offers himself to us and for us. He comes to us in the bread and cup of holy communion. And having heard and believed the preaching of those who have faithfully attended to the proper distinction of law and gospel, we eat this bread and drink this cup 
proclaiming the death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes in glory. The church testifies to the truth and the efficacy of the gospel, even as the witness of those who laid down their lives for the sake of the gospel shows that, as St. Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When the Lord returns from heaven with ten thousands of his saints, it'll be too late to say, I believe you now, Lord, please let me in. Today is the day. Now is the accepted time. Repent and believe the good news. Spread the glad tidings all around. Trust in God to keep his promises rather than trusting that man can come up with a better plan. You need Jesus, not a program. You need the word, not a marketing scheme. God is watching over his word to perform it, not our worldly philosophies echo through social media. And God and Christ is still walking with his church, still speaking through his church, still preserving his church, and still saving his church. Amen. And the peace of God that passes understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.